Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, very nice to see you all after the lunch break. So I'm Caroline Uhler. Um, I'm a professor here at MIT in IDSS and in EECS, as well as the Broad Institute, uh, where I co-direct the Eric and Wendy Schmidt Center, which is a newly established uh, center at the intersection uh, between machine learning and the biomedical sciences. Uh, I joined MIT in 2015 um, as a faculty, and uh, it was really Munzer's vision uh, for IDSS that really drew me uh, to come here. Uh, I remember when I was interviewing uh, during one of the snowstorms, one of these big snowstorms in 2015, um, where MIT was closed, uh, all trains were not running uh, for two or three days, I think MIT was closed. And I was meeting with Munzer for a couple of hours at the Kendall Hotel uh, in front of the fireplace, and he was telling me about the vision uh, for IDSS. And, you know, despite my huge dislike of snow and cold weather, all I wanted to do after that was actually join IDSS. So it was really his vision for building, you know, this um, a modern view of statistics where statistics and computation come together. Um, and then can, through that, impact the types of applications that we will be talking about today. Um, so in the biomedical sciences, we have seen this uh, huge uh, data explosion. And so I think it is really, you know, that we need as an important cornerstone for making uh, progress, we really need such a modern view of statistics where statistics and computation come together and of course then meet with uh, machine learning in order to have an impact. And, you know, if we think about the developments um, in this field, not so long ago, all the data that a biologist needed fit into a lab notebook, right? And you were able to actually summarize it um, in a lab notebook and then summarize it with um, some, you know, more simple uh, summary statistics. Um, but nowadays, even just a single lab can generate as much data as to rival um, the whole Netflix movie corpus. And just to give you an example, at the Broad, um, just the genomics platform alone actually produces 80 petabytes of data, has produced 80 petabytes of data last year. Um, so that's just genomics, so not even taking into account anything about imaging data, et cetera. Um, so those numbers are basically the same as what Twitter generated last year. Okay? And if you compare that to the whole, whole um, Netflix movie corpus, which is only 60 petabytes of data, um, that puts it a little bit into, um, into relations. Um, and also think about the type of data that this is, right? Um, so let's compare that to the Netflix uh, data. But, you know, for example, this uh, bro genomics data contains, for example, uh, the data set All of Us, which collects health and um, genetics information on one million Americans. Um, so there is certainly like big differences in terms of um, in terms of security questions, in terms of um, all kinds of questions that we will be actually talking about today um, with these kinds of data sets and also opportunities to really answer um, really important questions. So I think there is a real opportunity here and a necessity to bring statistics and computation really to bear on the biomedical sciences. And so I'm very, very excited to have uh, this distinguished panel here today. Um, who will be providing vignettes from their own research at this intersection uh, between um, human health and statistics, machine learning, and also discussing important questions and problems that arise at this intersection. And so I think we'll start uh, with Maya um, and then go by as the talks appear here. You can refill some Hi everyone, I'm Maya Majumder. I'm an assistant professor in the Computational Health Informatics program at Boston Children's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. And I am really delighted to be here. I was an IDSS graduate, PhD 2018. So it is nice to be back and see many familiar faces in the crowd. So today I wanna to use my allotted pre-panel time to offer a very small glimpse into a field that is highly relevant to statistics and human health, computational epidemiology. Computational epidemiology, or comp epi, is a relatively new, highly interdisciplinary, computational epidemiology is a relatively new, highly interdisciplinary field at the crossroads of digital data, machine learning, and public health. In my lab, we often leverage digital data sources like search query, mobile phone, and news and social media data 
combine them with more traditional health data like case counts and death counts, and then apply techniques from machine learning to not only improve our scientific understanding of public health problems, but to help shape the health policies used to address them in the most just way possible. I've been working in Comp Epi since 2014, so for nearly a decade now, and I've spent most of my time responding to global and domestic infectious disease crises, including Zika in Central and South America, Ebola in West Africa, and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome in the Arab world, as well as measles and mumps right here in the US. But today, to demonstrate just how broad of a field Comp Epi is, I'll be spending the next few minutes walking through some of my team's COVID-19 studies, followed by a very brief discussion of one of the most major challenges to the field that the pandemic has brought to light. Because time is very limited today, my discussion of each study will be rapid fire. But for those who are interested, all of them are open access and available online. My team's work on COVID-19 began in January 2020 when most of us here in the US were still blissfully unaware of the pandemic that lay ahead. As we often do at the beginning of a novel infectious disease crisis, we started by attempting to characterize the transmissibility of SARS-CoV-2 at its epicenter of emergence. Our first study used a phenomenological model and the limited data that were available through our estimates in early January to estimate the basic reproduction number, or r naught of SARS-CoV-2 in Wuhan, China. We found r naught at the beginning of the Wuhan epidemic to be in the ballpark of two, maybe three, and though our estimate was the first on record, it was quickly followed by estimates from other teams. To consolidate the work that both we and our colleagues were doing, we conducted a meta-analytical analysis across these estimates which appeared in the Lancet Global Health after being pre-printed in February 2020. We found that while there was variability across the early r not estimates, the mean was consistent and our work contributed towards WHO's pandemic declaration in March 2020. And that's when things really took off. Soon thereafter, we estimated r not across multiple cities in China as the pandemic began to spread. And importantly, this allowed us to evaluate whether environmental factors might impact transmission of SARS-CoV-2. Unfortunately, as we've all since learned from experience, we found that transmission could occur across climates and that warm weather wasn't likely to completely eliminate spread the way we've come to expect from other respiratory viruses. Of course, as the pandemic progressed beyond China, we expanded our geographies of interest and as contact reducing intervention policies like stay at home orders began to roll out around the world, we adopted more complex approaches to model them. To this end, our team built an agent-based model to simulate the impacts of stay-at-home orders and physical distancing. And in a 2020 pan paper, we applied this ABM to three of the hardest hit epicenters in the early days of the pandemic, Hubei, China, Lombardy, Italy, and New York City, New York. We then applied our ABM to individual states in India, as well as other states in the US followed by a new ABM that we built to expand our work into additional intervention policies like contact tracing, which allowed us to design a brand new policy called risk-based quarantining. We recognized early on though that simply simulating policies wasn't enough. We needed to evaluate the effectiveness of the policies that were actually in play. To do this, we first used mobility data from around the world to assess global adherence to contact reducing intervention policies. And then more recently, we zeroed in on the US to assess state level adherence, paying special attention to the impact of pre-existing state level paid sick leave policies on compliance with pandemic period contact reducing policies. Beyond mobility data though, we've also been using other digital data sources like search query, news coverage, and social media data to surveil the public health landscape in the US and around the world. For example, in Nature Digital Medicine, we showcased the ability to develop an early warning system for COVID-19 using Google search trends data from eight different countries. Meanwhile, in the Lancet Digital Health, we used Google search trends to show how President Trump's April 2020 remarks, which many of us probably remember, regarding the off-label use of disinfectants led to increased public interest, not only in drinking and injecting disinfectants, but in poison control calls as well. Soon thereafter, we used data on news coverage of candidate drugs for COVID-19-related repurposing 
and Google's search interest in those drugs to show how the news media were likely contributing to drug shortages here in the US. And more recently, we've been pairing Google search trends data with data from Twitter to identify attitudes and areas of COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. We've also become increasingly interested in case fatality rates and mortality analyses related to COVID-19, both in the pre and post vaccine phases of the pandemic. Our first study in this space involved examining risk factors for elevated COVID-19 case fatality at the US county level prior to vaccine availability during the first wave, followed by a state specific analysis of county level heterogeneity and excess mortality focusing on Colorado during the first wave. And then in JAMA Pediatrics, a pandemic period evaluation of suicide related excess mortality among American adolescents via an ongoing collaboration with 14 state health agencies. Our work on pandemic period mental health and behavioral health and advocacy more broadly is also evident in our, our ongoing natural language processing research. For instance, through a partnership with a large telemental health platform, we were able to analyze text messages between patients and providers to characterize population level psychological responses to the COVID-19 pandemic, including significant increases in anxiety. And more recently, we leveraged Twitter data to examine the impact evolving face mask guidance has on sentiments and emotions experienced by the US public, particularly with respect to their trust in public health institutions like the CDC. Though we've also recently discovered that existing sentiment analysis packages are likely inadequate for other topics of public interest that have emerged during the pandemic, such as the need for criminal justice reform during infectious disease crises. We've also expanded our NLP oriented research into meta science during the pandemic ranging from the development of a pipeline to map research gaps in the existing COVID-19 literature to interrogating gender disparities and COVID-19 clinical trial leadership. Clearly, my team has done quite a bit of work during the pandemic and all of it, in my view, falls under the broad umbrella that is computational epidemiology. But both during the pandemic and prior to it, the primary challenge we faced in CompEpi isn't a methods challenge or a domains challenge. As important as those challenges are, there's a much bigger challenge on the horizon and that challenge is communication. In other words, we frequently found ourselves asking this question, how can we effectively communicate our work to those who need to hear it? Those of us that work at this intersection of computing and human health do so because we want to see every person live the happiest and healthiest life that they can lead. But in public health especially, this often means persuading folks at multiple levels to make decisions that the math says are in their best interest. Which begs the question, how do we make our work more accessible, not only to policymakers, but to the public? I personally view science communication as being the key to these two questions. And as y'all can see here, I've dedicated quite a bit of my time to ensuring that my team's work reaches decision makers at every level, be it my neighbor down the street or my colleagues at the White House. Social media, news interviews, and editorials have allowed me to forge collaborations with state health agencies, attract the attention of federal research sponsors, and maybe most importantly, help everyday people make better public health choices in their day-to-day -day lives. But I'll be the first to admit that this kind of science communication is labor intensive and rarely rewarded, especially in academic settings. And as a result, there are very few incentives for those of us who conduct research in this area to actually engage with it. So in conclusion, I will leave all of us with one last question. How can we create a culture of science communication in the academic research environment? I look forward to exploring this question and many others on today's panel. Thank you for having me, everyone. Who's there? So I'm Emory Brown. I'm from the Department of Brain and Cognitive Sciences, also part of IDSS, and uh, I'm also at Harvard Medical School. And it's a real pleasure to be here as part of the celebration and to acknowledge all the, the great work that Munzer has done to make IDSS what it is today. So I'm gonna speak specifically about a real-time problem, in other words, closed-loop control of anesthesia, specifically the problem of controlling unconsciousness. Because this is one of the places where we have information which comes in literally on a 
on a second to second basis and we want to use it in real time to take care of a patient either in the operating room or in the intensive care unit. So this is what most people think of anesthesiology at the moment. In fact, someone just recently sent me this cartoon. So I want to convince you that there's a little bit more to it than just this, all right? All right. So what is general anesthesia? It's a drug-induced reversible state that consists of you're insensitive to pain, you're unconscious, you're, you don't form any memories, you're not moving around, you're physiologically stable and it's reversible, and it's a drug-induced reversible coma. And it's often said it's not clear how anesthesia works, and basically nothing could be further from the truth. And so let me just give you some idea of what that's like. So this is an EEG on someone who's conscious, let's say. And let's think of the cortex, the very important region in the front of the brain for processing information, for reasoning. And the thalamus, which is a major way station, all information in some form goes to the thalamus. Auditory information, visual information, and uh, sensory information, so pain. And it's, often, it's frequently communicating with the, with the frontal cortex, and it's doing it in such a way with very low amplitude, very low amplitude, high frequency oscillations, gamma oscillations, which are quite, very, very flexible. So the communication looks something like this. And it's kind, of, it's kind of broad band, basically. When I give an anesthetic drug, the EEG changes dramatically, going to these very low amplitude, so sort of large amplitude, low frequency oscillations, and the communication looks more like this. So in this situation, it's going to be much more difficult for the parts of the brain to communicate. And this is happening all over the entire brain. And you can imagine you doing this for like someone's brain in this state for four hours, three hours. It makes sense that your brain doesn't work after anesthesia. So one of the things which we could probably do is try to control the delivery of the drugs in a much more precise way. So closed loop control of anesthesia for medical coma. So let me set the context for you a little bit better. These are three fairly well-known people who had major head injuries. And as a consequence, they had to be placed in what we call a medical coma. So what is a medical coma? You just dial the anesthesia up until you see the pattern that I'm showing you there, this pattern here on the, on the EEG called burst suppression. It, the EEG bursts and it becomes flat and it bursts. The only thing which is deeper than this would just be a total flat line. And you hold the person in this state for several days, maybe in several weeks. I think Michael Schumacher was in a medical coma for a period of a month or so. Right? And the idea is to use this as a way to reduce intracranial pressure. Or if someone is having seizures, this is the way to treat seizures. Ultimately, if seizures can't be treated by standard medication, you actually bring someone into the, into the, into the, into the uh, intensive care unit, you start in, infusions of propofol, and you, and you hold them in this state until the seizures break. So we wanted to build a closed loop system to do this. This is something we did 10 years ago. So this isn't new. So it's a very st straightforward system. We have a rat in this case hooked up to we're measuring its EEG signals. And we have a, a marker which we're following right here, a marker which we're following. And we measure it from the EEG. And we take the difference between the target market, excuse me, marker, and that, the difference between the target and the, also the estimated value, it changes the infusion rate going into the animal. So, a very standard control setup. And the marker is this pattern of birth suppression. And so you can, it's easy to define, in some sense, the state of birth suppression because you just take the fraction of the time that the animal suppressed. In a second, if you want it to be 60%, then this is what it would look like. And so by setting that target, you could, you could think about how unconscious or how profoundly anesthetized you want the animal to be. So the best way to look at this is just to take it, see it in a video. This is a video that Miriam made, Miriam Sinichi, who did this work, and she was a PhD student and also a postdoc with me. So you'll see this here, the target will be the green line. And the white line where it says BSP here is what the controller is doing. This is the EEG up here, and this is the second to second update of the infusion rate of the pump. So this is only good if you can also then just change it to some level you want, put it in some sort of arbitrary state. So you move it up to 0.7, now it's, now it's suppressed 70% of the time, so it's controlling a the system there. And this makes a lot of sense to do something like this because in the ICU, people are in these states for days. It'd be like flying from here to Tokyo and saying, 
I'm going to guide the plane myself by hand the whole way. That's what we basically do now. We don't, we don't have any sort of control system. And here we're taking it up to like 0.9, so the person is 90% suppressed. So not surprising that, well, once you get the right physiology straight, doing a control system like this is not that hard to do. All right? And just to show you what we're able to accomplish, so we did different scenarios. I showed you animal two here. So this is just going up and up and up. And then if you look at this case here, so you go up and you come down. So to come down, I don't have a drug which turns birth suppression off. So look what the system did. It actually shut down until the signal drifted down to the target where it needed to be. Then the controller turned on again and started controlling the system. All right. So a very straightforward idea, very feasible. So the FDA told us 10 years ago, they said, that's cute, but not good enough. They said, you have to do it in larger animals. So we moved more recently to doing this for monkeys. And now, not just controlling someone in the ICU for the purpose of treating, treating a medical coma, but a state you could actually use in the operating room to take care of patients. So again, the same sort of idea. And these are the, the folks who have been working with on this. Suresh Chakrabarty, former PH, former postdoc, Jack, Jacob Donahue, PhD student. This is a research from Earl Miller over in BCS and getting our control ideas through, through Munzer and his group. So the same setup, you've got a marker here which controls unconsciousness, the, the target you want. You take the difference, controls the infusion rate. The duty cycle is 20 seconds. It's going to the animal. And you just basically update your, your target. And what's the target? So the target is basically going to be the power in the spectrogram between 20 and 30 hertz. And the reason we're using that is that it correlates very tightly with the spike rate of the neurons. So the neurons decline and spiking, which means the brain is shutting down. You can see that very directly in the power in the, in the spectrum. So let me just show you an example of this. So what, what Suresh did first was just let this run open loop. And so the target is going to be one to start off with. And it's running open loop, which means basically he just has a constant infusion running. There's no control. I just want to show you what happens to people when you have no control. The oscillations are just moving all over the place. The signals are moving all over the place. Now he's going to turn the controller on. The controller is going to take over the system right here. And it holds it. And it's going to move it up and down a couple of times. drops it down. So totally feasible. So this is what the system that we're looking to perfect in order to start a testing in humans eventually. And you can take it up to an even higher level. So I want to show you one thing here really quickly. This is what happens in the operating room right now. You have a constant infusion and people just get deeper and deeper and deeper. So it makes sense that person, most people in an anesthesia are overdosed. And one, not only because of this, but even more importantly, they're not using the EEG to track the brain states. So this is what I just told you about. This sort of mechanism of action is through oscillations. Because you have the oscillations there, you can build. And they're, highly, they're part of the process. They're not epiphenomenon. You can use this to actually build a control system. And these are things which we should be doing now going forward in the, in the operating room and in the and, and for surgery. What's essential is having a good approximate statistical or biological model. That's what makes this work. The control is really out of the textbook. I mean, the control theory is right out of the textbook. And then we want to go from what we had before to, to this. It's a great thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Marzia Gassimi, and I'm going to talk to you today about designing machine learning processes for equitable health systems. Um, my group is the Healthy Machine Learning Lab, and we focus on creating actionable insights in human health. And if you uh, haven't been reading the news recently, if you uh, were a patient like Sumana or had a patient like her who was having trouble breathing, there are a long list of clinical AI uh, that are available. Some are already cleared by the FDA that perform at or above humans, and they can do relevant task uh, prediction in a range of tasks across the human lifespan. 
Um, and so now the question is, let's say that uh, you go into the hospital and you've been you know, feeling a little bit sick and they want to know if you have pneumonia. So they take your chest x-ray and they say, listen, it's really busy. It's a Friday night. It's going to be three hours for a doctor to see this chest x-ray and triage you. Say you're healthy, you can go home or you need to stay here. We have a machine learning system that's been trained on over 700,000 images, chest x-rays, and it performs at or above human doctors in the, uh, the FDA clearance. Um, you can do this right now, and it'll triage you. It'll say you're healthy, you can go home, or you're not, you can stay here. Um, how many people would take that? You see some hands, right? Like there are some believers here, right? Some people would take that. And so maybe some people wouldn't take that. If you wouldn't take that, why? Right, it's probably noisy, right? And so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm showing you one number, right, for the performance here, 0.96. So most of you have probably been to a doctor in the past, you know, few years, and so you've probably had a variety of experiences at the doctor. This is my favorite graphic because people react really bimodally to it. I was using it to illustrate that uh, maybe you would receive care you didn't want, and the people I was presenting to at some point thought what I meant was, we can make AI as good as Dr. House. And then I, I tried to convince him, no, he was a drug addict, remember? He was abusive to his patients. That's not what we want, is it? Um, and so the issue here is that when we are learning machine-based uh, models, right, machine learning-based models, we're using all of the data that's available. Every visit you've had where it's busy, where a mistake was made, where doctors are understaffed, where the hospital system is being inefficient, that's data. And it's not labeled as bad data. It's all being ingested. And machine learning for health is uh, sort of lagging right now other fields in machine learning in terms of reproducibility. And so that means that when we have this problem, it's difficult to resolve it as a community because we don't have the same standards in terms of open data sets, open code bases, and reproducing our code on multiple data sets. So uh, how bad could this be, right? I just gave you a hypothetical. Let's find out. Let's say I took the three large open chest x-ray data sets that are available in the United States. One is West Coast, one is East Coast, one is Midwest. It's over 700,000 images, and I'm going to do exactly what I told you I was going to do. I'm going to train a type of convolutional neural network to predict you're healthy, right? So you don't have a diagnosis. I can send you home. And then I'm going to compare the false positive rate in different subpopulations, and I'm going to call that the model under diagnosis rate. And I'm going to call it under diagnosis because if I falsely positively say that you're healthy, you actually have a condition. And if I deployed this model, it would lead to a higher rate of no treatment in a subpopulation if they had a higher false positive rate. Right? So we trained this model. We had the best average AUC, just like that table, better than state of the art. We could publish this model, and you know, maybe the FDA would clear it. But that best model actually had the largest underdiagnosis rate in female patients, young patients, black patients, patients on Medicaid insurance. And intersectional identities do worse than aggregated groups. So that means if you are a black or Hispanic female patient, you do worse than white female patients or than female patients in general. And you might say, like one reviewer did to me, who I hate forever now, oh, the point is very simple. You're just trying to tell us that we should be auditing our models. The FDA does not require this yet, but we hear your point. Maybe every model should just have a few axes that you do a, a subgroup audit on and you should report that. But right now, uh, we are using models that may be very difficult to do subgroup-based uh, axial audits on. So for example, if we take not ChatGPT even, but just Cybert, right, which is trained on scientific abstracts, right, and fine-tuned on this data set. And we give it this prompt from a medical note where uh, I have redacted the race and the uh, outcome, and I do what many people right now are doing, many companies right now are doing, and I ask Cybert to fill in the blank. If I say that this patient was Caucasian or white and they became belligerent and violent, Cybert, openly available, you can download it right now, fills in the note with they should be sent to the hospital. If I fill it in with African, African-American, or black, it fills in the note with they should be sent to prison. 
This is problematic because it is not an easy thing to audit. And as many, many papers have demonstrated, it is not trivial to remove. Bias is a strong part of the clinical landscape. And if we simply automate the clinical practice that we are seeing everywhere right now, we will extend and exacerbate biases that are happening in clinical settings. Pop quiz. How bad could it be? You didn't expect a pop quiz, but here we are. This is a real patient note where I have redacted the self-reported race of this patient. Can you tell whether this patient would self-report their race as black or white? I hope you can't because none of the doctors we surveyed for this paper could. They were very bad at it. But machine learning models can. And they can't, uh, you know, maybe just do this only in one hospital setting. We took notes from both a New York hospital and a Boston hospital. That's over 4 million notes, actually. And even very simple models are able to tell when you redact self-reported race, what race this uh, patient would likely self-report. And some of this is for things that maybe make sense. It's a spurious correlation that is meaningful. So for example, in the Northeast, we see more patients that have a specific comorbidity. Um, they have hypertension, they need dialysis. However, there are also things that are super problematic, but well known in medical settings, such as dermatology textbooks have, I think, uh, e extremely few examples of any skin based presentation of illness. Correspondingly, clinicians aren't comfortable mentioning this skin based presentation of illness in melaninated skin. And so if you talk about the patient's skin at all, the model knows that the patient is probably white. We see even more troubling things like just the way that you describe a patient tends to be very different if they are black or white. You describe black patients and their families as more difficult. And maybe you can see how that would happen because you can imagine over millions and millions and millions of notes, I've made these small, you know, implicit differences in how I'm writing about patients and their families and then the model can tell. But what about medical imaging? This is a chest x-ray. Can you tell if this patient is black or white? Radiologists couldn't. We evaluated them. All of my friends in the area hate me. I make them take tests all the time. But machine learning models can. And so if you look at many different kinds of imaging modalities and many different sites, even sites that are balanced, for example, Emory, uh, for example, Emory University, which is patient balanced in terms of white and black patient population, we find that machine learning models can detect a patient's self-reported race. And again, I want to emphasize this is not genetic ancestry. This is your self-reported race, which we know comes with a great deal of heterogeneity. So what could this be? I gave you all of these theories of what it could be with the notes and then verified some of them. It's not the things that the radiologist thought it could be, like body mass index, breast density, bone density, or disease distribution. But there is spectral information. And so maybe you've heard of, for example, a commercial, camera not being, commercial cameras not being calibrated to capture variation in darker skin correctly. Medical imaging devices are also calibrated. And so we find here, even when you bandpass filter these images so they don't really look like chest x-rays that much anymore, there's enough spectral information such that melaninated skin uh, is obvious to medical imaging devices. Is that bad on its own? No. Is it bad that a chest x-ray uh, based machine learning model could perfectly tell if you self-reported black or white race when a doctor probably couldn't, and then it might be biased against a subgroup? Maybe. So what can we do? Is everything lost? No, it's not. We can be more careful about the kinds of machine learning applications that we apply to healthcare and what we develop in the domain. So for example, if you want a very simple model, one of the things you might imagine doing is actually building a parsimonious model from scratch because you need something that's easy to use, deploy, and verify. So if you wanted something that's a medical checklist, you could have a set of human uh, uh, subject experts, like doctors, come together as a panel and form a consensus. But that's hard to do. And then years later, what will happen is a great paper like this one will come out that says all of those risk scores that you all worked so hard to build, they're actually really biased. And they tend to over and under correct for risk in African American patients. So instead, why don't we learn optimally predictive checklists based on real data from a hospital setting? And when you do it this way with mixed and true programming, you can actually incorporate fairness constraints within the learning paradigm. And so as an example, if we want to predict mortality after continuous renal replacement therapy, which is a very uh, painful and expensive treatment, so maybe you don't want to give it to somebody if they'll die right after, but we want it to be fair, we could imagine first trying to build this checklist in this way. This is without fairness constraints. I gave this to my ICU colleagues who had asked for this checklist. 
and said, here you go. It performs really well. What do you think? And they said, well, it looks great. There's no obvious proxies for gender, right? I don't see height. I don't see weight. There's no obvious proxies we can think of for self-reported race. But this checklist actually has a max false positive rate gap between white men and black women of over 50%. And when we add in the fairness constraints, we lose some overall performance, but we gain more equitable predictive performance for this category. And this is always going to be a trade-off because data is not perfect and machine learning models are not perfect. So finally, if we know that data can't be perfect and models can't be perfect, what happens when we deploy these models? Let's say that we take the best model we have, it will have some biases, and hopefully I've convinced you it'll probably have biases against women and minorities. So let's think about a mental health crisis setting. And so what happens in these settings is you get a transcript like this, and then you have to make a very simple decision. Most of the time, you need to call for medical help. In fact, you only need to call for police help, what we say in the training, if there's a risk of violence. It's an if and only if label. So they're equivalent for a machine learning person. If there's a risk of violence, then you call for police, and you only call for police if there's a risk of violence. And when we surveyed people, clinicians and non-clinicians at baseline in this task, they were pretty fair. They didn't disproportionately call the police on black and Muslim people. And then we took a GPT model, which is very easy to bias. We only need a few examples, and it suddenly starts uh, being very uh, racist and saying that black and Muslim people should always have the police called on them, regardless of the content of the transcript. And then we allowed this model, we passed IRB, I promise, to give advice to doctors as they were trying to make a decision, doctors and not doctors, about whether to call the police or ask for medical help. But we gave this advice in both of the ways. We either gave it descriptively, where we said the if condition, this model thinks that there's a risk of violence, or we gave them the then condition, which is prescriptive, and gave them a recommendation. I want to stress to you that these are equivalent from a label perspective. They're the same thing. But what we found is that whereas doctors and non-doctors were not more likely to call the police on Muslim and black people at baseline, they were substantially more likely to call the police when they were given biased prescriptive recommendations. When the model told them what to do, they tended to follow it. When the model gave exactly the same biased advice in a descriptive way, participants retained their original fair decision making which honestly I have to tell you is wild. Like this was a very unexpected result uh, from this study. But I think it really leads me to the conclusion, which is there's no simple fixes for ethical machine learning and health. This is something that you're going to have to think through from the inception of problem selection and data collection, making sure you consider source of biases in the data, outcome definition and model development. We need to think about how to evaluate and train our models comprehensively. And finally, when we think about post-deployment considerations, we know that not all mo no model can be perfect. Not all gaps can be corrected. How do we create tools that are useful and when they're wrong, they don't disproportionately bias the people using them? Um, because if we uh, try to explain models, we're likely to fall into traps where we over-anchor to their advice, and instead we should strive for understandable tools and processes that are more transparent. Uh, this is work by my fantastic lab here at MIT, um, and I hope I've convinced you that we can carefully create actionable insights in human health. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Suvrit Sra. Uh, I'm faculty in IDSS and EECS. And in line with my IDSS side of thinking, I'm sharing with you a very applied side of my research plus uh, work life, which is different from my typical work, which is in uh, theoretical machine learning. And I call it from optimal to MLOPT, and this work that I'm sharing with you is something that I feel, I've, I've uh, talked with Munsar about such things a few times before. I think this very much aligns with the IDSS spirit. And uh, let me share with you some of those. And the, just to give context, this applied side of work is me taking the machine learning and optimization side of thoughts into uh, my very active startup, which is founded on uh, AI for social good and more broadly AI for societal good uh, motivations. So it's so it's actually stuff that's working out there, and you know it's a business. So uh, I'm not sharing publications here right now. 
So my motivation for a long time uh, intersects a lot with the kind of things uh, probably many of us do care about. More broadly, what do we really mean by AI for social good? And it's a very broad topic. And I'm focusing here only on uh, use of AI within the context of global health, but with the motto, do big things with small data, unlike most of uh, hype-based, buzz-based machine learning, which is do small things with big data, okay? And the challenges that you face in resource-critical environments, low resource, zero resource environments, they're very different, and which is a great times for theoretical-minded people that, okay, I can do a lot of careful mathematical modeling, thinking through things, and also discovering creative engineering solutions. Both go kind of hand in hand. And at a broader level, I'd say the two uh, healthcare-related things uh, I do care for, uh, I'm only gonna touch mostly on the human healthcare side, but the other angle to whatever I'm saying uh, also applies to kind of the health of the planet type of thinking, all right? And it's work which after many years of dealing with the academic type of interactions in healthcare, working with people at few universities, trying to get into the hospitals, etc., eventually uh, pivoted into something which I think is closer to my own expertise, so it's uh, grounded in optimization plus ML, so it's not addressing healthcare from a doctor's perspective, literally, but the focus now is very, very modest. You know, how should we more efficiently bring healthcare to people in resource-challenged areas? So that's why I say do more with less which at some point, I guess that was, uh, that's also the lids uh, where I'm a member, you know, philosophy, more is less, uh, oh, sorry, less is more, or whatever, <laughs> you know? So, okay. One of the cool things I hope to address during the panel is thoughts that people may have broadly as an audience. How to do machine learning when you have zero data? Okay, we'll, we'll come back to that during the panel. I, I really like that topic. So the opportunity that eventually is very close to opt plus ML, and I'm clearly not the first one to realize this. Many people have realized this. And, but within the context of a uh, startup, the opportunity for us lies in the age-old place where optimization, modern optimization took off, and that's really uh, supply chains and networks except with the newer things of, okay, human in the loop based learning, how can the human inform make sense of these complicated decision problems, stochastic control, non-stochastic control problems, or just purely learning problems. And uh, that's what it's all uh, centered around. So the, some of the very standard impactful problems that arise are that, uh, Supply chains in resource-challenged areas are also, they're kind of often ad hoc and not very well defined. So modeling them and using them is uh, often challenging. So I wanna talk about like some concrete problems uh, that you can imagine and instantly you'll say, okay, I'm familiar with this and I can think about what I could do with those. So some very concrete problems to think about in those contexts is what is my supply chain? Where are my assets? So if I'm trying to uh, build just a simple model of what my network is, where are the different, uh, you know, source and sinks and the other intermediate nodes, for instance, and what do each of those nodes contain? Just getting an information of the state out there is challenging because, you know, not everything everywhere is running in a database that you can just write a SQL query and do the job. So there's a lot of interesting ML plus engineering that goes into answering even that basic question. Including in many places, uh, solving things like, I wanna do geolocation uh, without access to GPS, things like that. Or 
of course, classical things, I don't want to bore you with lists, but you can kind of see classical problems like, uh, you know, what, what items do I have available in my drugstore? Can I quickly do inventory management? Because I'm not really running a database. I maybe wrote down on ha by hand, or maybe I didn't even write down, what stuff do I have? And I'll show you examples where we did that. And the standard things of, okay, I can forecast demands, so now things are closer to the time series or rather discrete time event type of data and you want to do demand forecasting. More interestingly, in many cases, you want to do supply forecasting, what supply may be available. And then, of course, uh, uh, you want to optimally allocate resources. And the reason I put opt ML and MLopt together here is because of this uh, valuable end-to-end -end thinking these days that rather than just force prescribe a model with force prescribed costs or constraints, et cetera, can you learn models worth optimizing that are informed by predictions or machine learning or data or human in the loop and then do the job? Or can you do the whole thing end to end? And I must tell you that uh, uh, I used to think of that, uh, uh, I'm not a big fan of end to end thinking, but uh, Actually, in many cases, you can. The forecasting-based model, so rather than, so you know, uh, to give a concrete example, say rather than use a differential equation which is describing the blah, blah, blah of something, fine. W what if you just postulate a more general model to describe how much something may cost, what the constraints may be? You run a machine learning model which forecasts all the quantities, does uncertainty estimation, to say that, yeah, I forecast that within, with this confidence, you will have this much of this. And then you want to run an allocation, which is a nonlinear integer program. And, but can you do this uh, jointly? Because when we estimate uncertainties doing either Bayesian models or machine learning based uh, methods, you don't always need to do a great job to estimate uh, these quantities for every data point accurately. But which data points matter, ultimately it matters because we are not doing predictions in a vacuum, right? The predictions have to go into a decision. So in some sense, uh, this is a canonical example of a bi-level type of thinking. You know, you want to do well on something while being also great at prediction. So anyhow, I'm just throwing together some keywords for people uh, who kind of uh, may relate to those keywords about things potentially happening under the hood. So a concrete example was just a ve very, very simple thing. I want to just count, uh, this was uh, work we did uh, during the COVID period, hel helping with the vaccine supply chains in several African countries, and then we generalized this to other places. Just to help the person on the ground count how many vials of vaccines they had just roughly doing inventory counting. Well, you can say that it's a very simple computer vision problem. Yes, I can take that. It's, it's not that simple even as a computer vision problem. Uh, but our challenge was whatever you build had better run on just an Android phone without needing constant connectivity. So it's not that it's a giant GPT, uh, Facebook segmentation model running in the cloud. This stuff's got to run on a device. Otherwise, nobody's going to use it. And it's got to better be accurate more than 95 to 99% of the time to actually have that value. So uh, we did this in a few setups and um, it kind of uh, escaped the original social good sector and then the US Department of Defense got very interested in being able to do these things for their inventory management, but just saying, uh, sometimes yeah, actions have unintended consequences, but uh, anyhow. And the part that I really like, uh, uh, as I already talked about, this predict and then optimize. In fact, uh, uh, I don't see Devavrat here, but I think Devavrat is an expert. Oh, there. He's an expert in this type of thinking. And uh, we hope to together go to some uh, conference where we may talk about such things that, you know, we never. So the most important takeaway for the machine learners or just uh, data driven people in the room. Our, and I mean, Marzia spoke to so many aspects of that. The, our predictions are not gonna live in a vacuum. 
they may be meaningless until some subsequent action can be taken on them. Could be a policy action, could be an allocation action, could be a whatever action. So how, how do we build models that learn from data and do that uh, end to end by respecting fairness, optimization, challenges, you know, not having access to giant cloud, et cetera. It's all pretty challenging. Uh, this is an example for, uh, from uh, trying to optimally allocate resources of providing healthcare at several health facilities in Sierra Leone. Uh, and they have a very progressive health minister, I think, who's a graduate of MIT Media Lab, so he kind of gets technology. So he, he helped push this thing through, that you want to do this data-driven allocation where there is need, how to move things around, and to be able to more effectively use what you have already there. So that's why I say to do more from less. Governments are not interested in saying, listening to you, that spend more money, put in more. They don't have that stuff to put in more. They just want to get more out of what they have. And anyhow, anyhow, there's a long list of such things. I don't want to kind of bore you with several other examples. But what I wanted to impress upon you here is solving these types of sophisticated machine learning and optimization problems when you have little to no data opens a new set of research questions worth thinking about in terms of uh, generalizing, in terms of distribution shifts, in terms of uh, unsupervised learning, in terms of uh, fine tuning, so, so at the cutting edge of the research spectrum. And I learned about so many new ways to think about machine learning after touching all these applications, which are all deployed and working out there. So kind of that's why I'm quite excited to listen to uh, both the audience and the rest of the panelists about different aspects of dealing with real world data, especially when you're talking about healthcare type of stuff. Thank you. Perfect, thank you very much. So thank you first of all to all the panelists for such um, wonderful talks. Um, so also now it's open also for questions um, from the audience and of course also from panelists to each other. So if you have any questions, please do come uh, to the microphone. And I'll maybe get us started with something that you know has really come up in all these talks about um, how important it is and how difficult it also is to get all these methods really adopted and, and into practice, right? And going all the way through. And I think in all these talks it came up. And it came up with different types of strategies. One is, you know, really focusing on science communication and through that have that um, be adopted or get to the right people and then through that become adopted. Or, you know, if you have this huge advantage of being a medical doctor yourself, of being able to adopt it directly, of course, most of us don't have that and need to think about other strategies of how to go there. And then also the other problems that maybe also Suvreet brought up that, and Devavrat actually asked yesterday about, you know, there is another step of going from methods all the way to a deployment, which is the whole, you know, setting up software, et cetera, et cetera, to get it all the way through. And so I wanted to have a little bit of a discussion here about, you know, what do you see as the biggest challenges? What are like, you know, some uh, success stories which we've seen, but, you know, on the way there were a lot of um, decisions that you had to take. Um, and what do you think are the main strategies um, that we should be working on in order to get it all the way through to deployment? Well, I, I think the most important strategy, which sounds like a tautological thing, is uh, not to give up. That's by far the most important strategy. Everything else eventually follows, uh, but I think it's... Uh, a lot of that is a people's skill communication thing. And as we were talking yesterday, uh, I'm going to pseudo quote Devavrat's words. In At least in many situations for long, there was a huge resistance to the use of AI. Or people would say, do I really need it? I just got my other weapons. Or, you know, inertia is a big thing, a problem that one has to overcome. But luckily now, the world seems to be much more open to saying, okay, fine, you know, we, we get it, we want AI. So somehow that roadblock is gone. But nevertheless, I think, uh, I also learned this uh, valuable lesson from Professor Alan Wilski when he was my neighbor at Leeds, 
that you need to find in all those places that you're trying to take your ideas and technology to, the champions in there who will help make it happen. And it's the same thing when you're talking with the government in Africa, you ultimately the result, whether this gets adopted or not, is say decided by the minister, but there are there technology people who want to be the ones bringing that thing in. They want the credit for that. So a lot of it is, I guess, the human side of things. And continuing to work on that and not giving up is very important. Luckily, at my startup, it was the business side of people who are doing this. I'm doing only the science side, but I learned many <laughs> valuable lessons from them. Well, like in our situation, the communication is key, as was mentioned. You have to really convince the FDA that this is something which is, it works, it's gonna work reliably. And also what, has to ha what happens is because the FDA has never evaluated something like this, it's not just a drug, it's, it's a new type of device. They, they're, they're thinking on how they're going to evaluate it evolves also. And if you can manage to stay one step ahead of them and sort of guide them through that process, in other words, try to create as, try to think of all the questions that they're going to ask you beforehand. Obviously it's impossible, it's not, you can't think of all of them. I think that's also gonna help and be very, 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 very key. Because what, the, what they, in, in our experiences with them, what they do is they stand there and they just try to see how many questions they can ask you that you can't answer, essentially, or answer satisfactorily. So I think that trying to think of those ideas prospectively is really key. With one more question regarding the FDA. So you also said that actually the measurements are not currently being done in the operating room. So here you would have to go through two steps of like changing what is being measured and then also getting this closed loop through FDA approval. The, the use of the EEG in the United States is not standard. And so as a MOA, of course, and it's much used much more extensively in Latin America, South America in, in, uh, in Spain, also in Europe, and also in the United Kingdom, but not in the United States. So again, these, as I think was mentioned, these sort of kind of practice biases. Sort of, so, you, so there's some big sociological hurdles to be gotten over. And, one, and I, I, I couldn't agree more with what was said earlier. You just gotta persist and, and not give up because uh, otherwise it'll never, it'll never be accepted. Um, I think in the in the more deployment focused uh, studies that I've done, the I think it's it's true you just have to persist forever and you have to have very good communication skills. Um, I think some of the challenges have been um, trying to understand how constraints in a very different setting from yours need to influence the model that you're making. Um, and so if you have, you know, an ICU, an intensive care unit where they have a, a finite number of beds, right, um, the, even if you gave them, you know, uh, an alert and said this many people from uh, general internal medicine need an ICU bed, there aren't that many ICU beds, you know, there's no place for those people to go. And so uh, much like the very last example I spoke of, right, where you know, you could tell people the if condition or the then condition. The details of how you give people information are, are very important because your model's not making the final decision in a lot of these cases. It's giving advice to another individual that is going to make these decisions. Um, and so if I'm the person making a decision about whether somebody should be on the general internal medicine floor or go to the ICU, what I might want is a ranking right, like a relative risk of here's the ranked order. I know you only have so many beds, so you might want to go down this list in this order. Um, so I, I think it's like, a, I don't think this is true when, for example, you are a doctor, and so you work in both of the places that you happen to be innovating. Um, and I also think that having a startup is, is this amazing opportunity because you have people who, their whole job is to know the domain and know that this product will work well. But I think if you're if you're in academia mostly, 
it's very difficult, like from my perspective, I, I really have to like have very detailed conversations with the clinicians and say, but why would, what would change your decision making? Why would you listen to it? Why wouldn't you listen to it? Because I'm not in those settings. And so it's, it's very important to listen to, you know, you don't understand, right? Like it doesn't matter if you tell us we need 30, right? Because we don't have 30. I think you bring up a really good point. In fact, you know, the, this distinction between working primarily in academia versus in some sort of practice area, whether it be a startup or, you know, actually in the operating room. And I think that this leans quite heavily into how I closed my talk, which is, you know, how do we actually prioritize some of these things in academic research? Because I think though me and my esteemed panelists care quite deeply about taking our work to practice, there isn't always a reward structure for this in academic research. And I think that it is very easy to get stuck at the scale of, well, I published the paper and that's enough. And I think that that's the piece of this that I think we really need to explore because of course we're here to celebrate IDSSS, right? And this is a, it's an academic institution. So I think it's, it's something culturally that we need to think about as well because while well, persistence is key, communication is key, and of course, actually bringing our work to practice is key, we need to put our money where our mouths are. And I think that ultimately right now, the way that academic structures are designed is, we're a publish or perish society. We're not a practice or perish society. So I think that this is something that we need to consider on a much broader philosophical scale, in addition to all the wonderful things that my co-panelists just mentioned. Uh you spoke to the potential for parsimonious models to prevent bias. I'm curious what your thoughts are on the potential for AI explainability to detect bias in black box models, and if so, what would you like to see out of it? Uh, so I, I believe the question was about uh, whether more parsimonious models can avoid bias and whether there are uh, good AI explainability methods that could maybe help target bias um, in some of the larger uh, uh, parameter-rich models, right? These very large models that we're training. Um, so I will say, uh, clearly you have not read my paper, The False Hope of Explainable AI in Medicine. Um, so I, I actually, uh, personally, this is, this is my personal and professional belief, I believe that explainable models are very dangerous in healthcare. And it's because of the humans. That's because when you show humans parsimonious explainable models, they listen to them even when they're wrong in ways that they don't as much for black box models. And so uh, there have been a lot of really good studies done, not by my group, but uh, just by like human computer interaction groups demonstrating that parsimonious models, when incorrect, destroy human accuracy at tasks that they're very good at um, normally. And uh, if you give the same black box recommendation to a, a human making a decision that's obviously wrong, they'll say, no, that's obviously wrong. But when it's explained parsimoniously, somehow they say, oh, it gave me a reason, it must be right. So I think for the purpose we often use it for in other settings, like, um, here's a parsimonious model, so you can look at the things and you can feel confident and you should follow the model. I, I think we should never have that in healthcare because I never want a doctor to turn off their critical thinking and feel like, oh, well, it explained its, its thing to me and I'm, I'm good with that. Um, what I do think explainability methods are very good for is for model developers trying to understand what a model is doing what the problems might be, and how could I fix or address them. So I think these methods are incredibly valuable for us to have in like this machine learning, you know, technical toolkit. But I'm uh, very worried that they've like escaped the lab. You know, like they're out there and people think that they're, they should be used in these sort of human facing ways. And there's so much really good non-machine learning, just HCI work showing that that's, that's a dangerous thing. I want to follow up because I think that this is a really, really interesting point, and I, I agree with you fully. And it's interesting from the perspective, again, of practice, because I think one of the things that explainable and interpretable models have really pitched themselves as is, well, if you can explain it or interpret it, then people who need to take it up are actually going to take it up, right? So it's this idea that it's almost like a marketing ploy, right, in a lot of ways. And I think that 
what you're raising is really interesting where it's a matter of, well, maybe if we pose this, uh, almost like this black box in some ways to a human being, we're really encouraging them to also use their own conscience, their own intelligence to help make decisions. And that really encourages the human in the loop paradigm. So I think this is a very, very interesting problem. And you know, I'm not sure what the solution is, but I do think that there is quite a bit of uh, nuance here in terms of how we're using these labels too, to encourage practitioners to take up these products. Uh, I, I agree with the the risk of this, you know, because of the built-in desire of the human mind to seek reason whenever when there might be none or there might be many, uh, that can be a damaging bias. Uh, however, I still feel there's a tremendous value to this explainable and interpretable stuff, not necessarily in the hands of the decision maker but in terms of the communication to the wider population so that their resistance to adoption could decrease. And I feel it may help the communication agenda quite a bit, even though ultimately when it comes to the decision making, reducing the human decision makers, critical thinking faculties, anything that decreases that uh, is probably a bad idea. So there's a kind of more nuanced situation. And the only thing which I would add, I, I, I totally get Marjorie's point about the uh, use of sort of black box models. But I think one of the things which we have to try to, which we have to remember is there are these principles of physiology which are underlying all of this. And what the models can help us do, the black box models, they can help us interpolate in areas which we can't see. But there's still this fundamental physiology which we want to get to and we want to understand, which is, which is actually critical. And once we understand that, and once we're able to use it, we can build more principled, one of a better word, simpler models or what have you. But we, we can't miss the opportunity to, to, uh, to, to sort of try to create fundamental physiology because that's, what, that's what's driving medicine ultimately. Hi, uh, I have a question about uh, disease diagnosis biases. Uh, my question is how we can identify when the model is fairness or biases. Um, for example, um, we know that there is a predisposition for some illnesses. For example, for white people, it's more common to, to have a skin cancer. Um, how we know if the, the information of the kind of skin is necessary for a model, if some uh, med uh, doctors need this information for a diagnosis. How we can identify if a model are um, is biases in this situation or not? So I I think the question was in in healthcare settings you have maybe some attributes like uh, gender or skin tone, and those are maybe causal variables, legitimate causal variables for things like. Uh, a skin cancer risk because of melanin level, or for breast cancer in terms of um, uh, biological sex at birth being female, for example. But there are also variables that you know might be misused, right? Because we have spurious correlations with um, believing that you know women don't suffer from certain diseases, or you know how do we uh, test for bias and disentangle? true uh, demographic-based associations from spurious ones. Is that, that's right? Yeah. OK. Um, that's a hard problem. Uh, there are some methodological ways to try to address that. So uh, we wrote a paper recently where we were looking at how you can try to disentangle different kinds of these, these data set problems. So there's spurious correlation, right, where you have maybe attributes and then classes. So maybe you have attributes like um, sex at birth or uh, skin tone or whatever it is on this part of the graph. And then on this part of the graph, you have um, a diagnosis, right, different kinds of conditions. A spurious correlation would mean the diagonal is hot, right? I tend to see this kind of condition with this kind of attribute. That doesn't mean it's causal. It just means that that's what I'm seeing in, in the data I have. But there's other kinds of things that have been underexplored too. So for spurious correlation, there's some really great methods that you can uh, use now. 
uh, that are very popular in a lot of the machine learning papers like group DRO or just train twice. You have to have some knowledge of the, the demographic groups and some knowledge of like things that might be true associations. But uh, given some knowledge, you can remove some of these like spurious correlations. So there, there is some work recently um, that does pretty well at that. There are other kinds of issues like attribute imbalance. I just see mostly one attribute. I, like, for example, in the uh, famous, infamous AKI prediction paper um, that was done by DeepMind and the VA, VA data is 6% female. So if you can predict acute kidney injury in the VA patients, it probably won't work on everybody. And that was uh, shown very recently by Karen Deep Singh at University of Michigan, where that model, this you know great model that was published, everybody was really excited about, it fails really, really dramatically in female patients. You could have class imbalance where you know maybe I have even distribution of attributes, but I see only one kind of class. So I very rarely see patients with endometriosis because it's often very, very delayed in diagnosis, right? Um, or you could just have uh, attribute generalization issues where I just haven't seen any examples of a person of this attribute in this class. In all of those cases, uh, we actually found that uh, these state-of-the-art methods do really poorly. So as a machine learning community, as a you know, statistical inference community, we don't have really good methods currently that work well on established benchmark data sets that have those kinds of problems. So I, I think understanding the kind of correlation you have and having a little bit of external knowledge can help, but only in specific settings. And it's an open research question for some settings. Thank you. I'm being told by Suze that we do have to stop it here. And I think it's perfect to stop it with open questions to invite all of the young people here to actually join us in this, you know, in this like building these new bridges between um, statistics and human health. There are just so many exciting questions um, that we all should be working on. And hopefully this will continue this discussion with all of these panelists after this panel. So thank you all very, very much for some great talks and thanks for all of the questions. <laughs>